Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We'll go ahead and uh, start. Uh, firstly, hi, Yakwe, as we say in the Marshall Islands. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We are excited to share with you the Marshall Islands journey to achieving climate resilience by transiting to sustainable sea transport. My name is Clarence Samuel. I'm the director for the Climate Change Directorate under the Ministry of Environment uh, with the government of the Marshall Islands. I am very happy to be here on behalf of my colleagues at WAM, or as we call it, Mar uh, One Island Module, and the Ministry of Transport, who unfortunately were unable to join us in person. The Marshall Islands comprises 29 atolls and five islets scattered across 2.5 million square kilometers of ocean. Because of the remoteness of the islands, sea transport is essential not just for economic activities, but to transport basic supplies, services, needs for the Marshallese population. The shipping sector contributes a significant amount of global green, greenhouse gas emission. If this sector was a country, it would be number eight in terms of emitting carbon. In contrast, the Marshall Islands only contribute a nil amount of carbon emission. Despite our minute carbon emission, we have taken a giant leap forward that many others need to take and set very ambitious goals in our nationally determined contributions to reduce emission from domestic shipping by 40% in 2030 and a full decarbonization of the sector in 2050. The Marshall Islands was one of the first country worldwide to do this. Now, traditionally, Marshallese people are navigators. Our, an our ancestors travel frequently between the atolls on big offshore canoes called wallop, using wind, stars, and wave patterns for navigating to gather food, fish, visit families and friends, to trade, and occasionally to go at war. Unfortunately, today more than three-fourths of our community, communities no longer use our traditional canoes for the daily livelihood, and most of our old master canoe builders and navigators have since passed. Sadly, these communities now highly depend on both motorized and fuel-consuming boats. However, under the low-carbon sea transport project, we have partnered with various organization nationally and internationally, including a local NGO called WAM, as I mentioned before, not only to fulfill our NDC objectives and goals under the Paris Agreement, but to revitalize and bring back the traditional canoe building knowledge through a comprehensive training program that promotes sustainable living and preservation of culture. Sustainable economic and culture development, national cohesiveness, and strengthening self-identity are essential to, to us and to our society. We are very grateful for partners like GIZ, BMU, WAM, and others that have helped us in our efforts to transit, transit away from fossil fuel to more sustainable means of transport and incorporating our traditional knowledge and culture to build resilience. I will now pass the mic to Henrik, who will give you a more in-depth look into the low carbon sea transport project. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Farrakh, for your words, Clarence. Um, my name is Henrik Richter-Alten. I'm uh, engineer specialized in low carbon sea transport based in Germany. Um, low carbon sea transport, that means I'm studying everything from propulsion to ship design, um, energy supply that deals 
with uh, shipping and transporting goods as well as fishing. And as uh, already introduced, the Marshall Islands are an island nation far scattered over the ocean. They really depend on shipping. Shipping is anytime you want to do something on the Marshall Islands, you need a boat for it. When you want to go somewhere, you need a boat. When you want to use the natural resources, you're going to need a ship. So the past decades, the Marshall Islands depend for shipping on fossil fuel. And the import of fossil fuel is actually a big burden for the annual budget of this small nation. So alternatives are very much needed and that's where we jumped in with the low carbon sea transport project. So what we're trying to do is to decarbonize the entire domestic shipping sector of the Marshall Islands and um, yeah, make it more sustainable and more locally based. We have uh, a two-pronged um, two approach on that. First, um, it is about uh, the inside lagoon transportation. So that is everything that is within the lagoon. So all coastal-based uh, ships like um, ferries, commuting, small recreational crafts, um, small fishing vessels, small transporters, everything that is close to land. And then we have a second, uh, a second part of the project that's about the inter-atoll transportation. So that is everything that is in between atolls. That is in the case of the Marshall Islands, I think the shortest distance is about 10, 11 miles, but the longest could be even 900 miles. So to give you a better uh, impression of what exactly we're working with, I would like to show you a um, video that we recently produced that pretty much shows what we are doing there in the, different, in the two different uh, project parts. Since January 2021, the sailing cargo ship Kwai is owned by the Republic of the Marshall Islands. In the Marshalls, more than 1,000 islands are scattered over a surface area of a size comparable to Mexico. Maritime transport is essential for economic activity, connectivity, and resilience in the ocean nation. Also, it is a significant factor for delivering education, health, environmental, and economic development, including response to climate change impacts. Still, RMI is almost entirely dependent on imported fossil fuels, which places a heavy burden on national and household budgets. Shifting from the use of fossil fuel propulsion to renewable energy sources helps in reducing the cost of providing regular and reliable transfer services to outer island communities, thereby supporting more inclusive and sustainable economic growth for the country. With the German-funded bilateral project between the Ministry of Transportation, Communication and Information Technologies in the Marshall Islands and Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GIZ, are jointly implementing a project on transitioning to low-carbon sea transport, funded by the German Ministry of Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. The implementing partner, the Marshall Islands Shipping Cooperation, agreed on a four-month charter of the SV Quiet between September and December 2020 to test their capacity in national waters. The Kwai is a seaworthy sailing vessel, equipped with engine assistance for maneuvering during windless and calm conditions. The Marshallese government agreed on the purchase of the Kwai in late December 2020, 
Overall, the proposed scenario of the purchase intended to maximize RMI's chances of a real transition towards low-carbon sea transport. With a focus on skills development and scalability and replicability of the developed technologies and newly gained capabilities. As clearly said in the Teleteleo strategy of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the RMI is targeting net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. In the transport sector, land, aviation, and sea transport, a 16% reduction of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide by the year 2025 and of 27% by the year 2030 is aimed. Particularly in the sea transport area, it has been agreed on a 40% reduction by 2030 and full decarbonization by the year 2050, as set out in the UNFCCC and DC commitments. The German-funded project Low Carbon Sea Transport aims at reducing CO2 emissions of domestic sea transport in the Marshall Islands to help achieving RMI's NDC objectives. For now, SVQI will make her round trips to all parts of the Marshall Islands. Thousands of tons of materials will be sold nearly emission-free by crew from the Marshall Island Shipping Cooperation. The impact on shipping already became apparent, as one of the busiest vessels hauling Copra to Mejuro and taking passengers and cargo to the outer islands, she has proven the advantages of wind-propelled ships. And the loan that was used to finance the purchase was already paid off. Now SV Quiet is making profits for the Marshall Islands Shipping Cooperation. Respectable scene, SV Kwai jointly with the German-funded and more modern sailing cargo freighter will furthermore provide a much-needed platform for particular maritime training. The new built sailing ship includes special areas designated for teaching and training. SV Kwai for now already allows Marshallese seamen to learn the basics of sailing a 120 feet ship by the means of wind energy. The initiative is provided a great example that low carbon sea transportation is feasible and beneficial, which is much needed to mitigate climate change. As part of the ambitious project, a sailing cargo vessel for inter atoll sea transport in RMI has to be designed, built, tested and assessed in the domestic waters of Marshall Islands. At a later stage of the project, a mature concept for low carbon shipping technologies will be disseminated through the region. Yes, I think that gave a pretty good uh, impression um, what the Marshall Islands are, how they look like, and what we're doing there. So we have this group of large ships with the Kwai as first sailing vessel. They are operated, operated by MISC, by the Marshall Islands Shipping Corporation. And then we have for the coastal-based transport and fishing lots of small traditional canoes and if you think about it where the Marshall Islands are 
and that they are settled for a few thousand years now. In the past, the people had means of transport to get there. And what we see here on this picture um, is a large voyaging canoe. It's called a wallop. This picture was taken in uh, Jaluit in the 1880s when the Marshall Islands were uh, under German protectorate. And um, it's these, these large wallops, unfortunately, as Clarence already introduced, they are unfortunately a thing of the past because all this, this knowledge faded away. So there are no big canoes, no big, huge, traditional uh, sailing vessels in the Marshall Islands in operation anymore. But what we still have there on the next slide are smaller lagoon-based canoes. They are still in use in some atolls, not in all, and um, still part of the Marshallese uh, culture and everyday life. So, there's one organization that's called Wana Elon in Majil, or in English, Canoes of the Marshall Islands, that um, has a big share in, uh, well, it is, a, it, it is part of, of uh, because of Wana Elon in Majil, that these canoes are still there, and that most of this knowledge, at least for the smaller ones, uh, could be preserved and that they're still sailing and still in operation. So Wana Elon in Majel or Wam, I will just say Wam because it's shorter, is it's difficult to describe what it really is. It is a center for documentation, a cultural, uh, cultural knowledge keeper. At the same time, it's a school, it's a boatyard. Um, they have a canoe house where they build and maintain traditional canoes. Um, they do carpenting trainings for Marshallese people. Every year they take in uh, youth at risk, like dropout students or other young people, young Marshallese with problems. They take them from hanging out on the streets and give them education half a day, like math, science, um, everything you need to know today. And the second half of the day, they learn canoe building and carpeting. WAM is also a very important partner for um, low carbon sea transport and for the entire canoeing culture in the Marshall Islands. Because um, they are now keeping these canoeing things, this canoeing uh, tradition alive for the last 30 years. So, one very important person here is Mr. Elson Kilen. He had, he has been wearing many hats in his, in his life. He had many different jobs. Actually, so many that I need to read them from my paper. <laughs> so, first of all, he's a counselor. He's, um, he has been assisting Juana Elon Kane, that was a predecessor of Juana Elon and Magil was a documentation project. He's been assisting there as a research fellow. He was the co-founder of WAM 30 years ago. He used to be the mayor and councilman of the Bikini Atoll. That is the place where the Americans were testing the nuclear weapons after World War II. Then he is the um, president of the and NGO Council in the Marshall Islands. He used to be chairman of the Marshall Islands Shipping Corporation. And last but not least, a member of the Nuclear Commission for the Marshall Islands. So I think he's the best one to explain what WAM is and what WAM really does. So to copy with the um, time difference between here and Maduro, which is almost 12, no, it is exactly 12 hours. We have pre-recorded a video, so it's almost like live, but not really. Yeah, okay. My name is Alison Keller, and I am from the Marshall Islands. 
I'm the director of the One Island in Module program, or the Canoes of the Marshall Islands, a program for the at-risk youth in the Marshalls. Marshall Island is a very small country uh, located between the Hawaii and uh, Australia in the middle of the Pacific Island. It's about 2,400 miles from Hawaii, southwest of Hawaii. Um, we are very few resources that we, the country we survive on, and it mainly is fishing and copra oil uh, uh, production. The island is only one or two meters above uh, sea level, so any changes in seawater or sea level, you know, it just, it's just not good for the island, you know. Um, our life and our food trees also depend on a very thin uh, water lens and, and, and uh, whenever the salt water come in it's destroy a lot of our uh, food tree. For the last 2,000 years we depend on the water, we depend on voyaging because the islands are so you know far apart whenever we need uh, to travel, we always depend on the uh, on our voyaging skills, and we are known around the world as one of the best canoe builders and voyages, you know, uh, in the Pacific, if not the world. So, uh, voyaging is very important, which means that our, you know, our canoes, our trees, all depend on that. Because when we uh, when we plant trees, we also plant. Timber. That's mean that we're planting the timber for our future canoes. So the process is a long process. Where um, if I want my grandson to have a canoe, I start the project today by planting uh, the breadfruit tree. And between now and then, we survive on these trees. But when we get to that point, then the tree is used for our kids, so our grandkids to build their canoes, which they can voyage between the islands to, uh, for trading or bringing food or taking food to their, our families on the other side. And oh, again, we can go fish and use our very limited resources. So why are traditional canoes so important? How can an artifact from the past contribute to climate resilience in the future? Our life mainly depends on our vessels. This is the backbone of our life. So. Um, anything that we do on these very limited islands are depend on the canoes. Our country is 99% water and it's a huge country which means our traditional canoes are very needed. So in order to be able to um, use these canoes we have to share the knowledge of our traditional canoe skills with our uh, younger generation. But at the same time, I think this is something that is very important today. It's not something of the past, because when you look at the design of our canoes, um, the asymmetrical shape of the canoe prevents the canoe from lateral lift, which means there's no tagger board. The design of asymmetrical shape is the same design that is used on the airplane wing, which create lift for the airplane. Uh, so without that design, the airplane won't be Flying. So it's not something of the past, it's something of the present and the future. Um, and it's, it's not, we're not using fossil fuel for it. So it's a win-win situation for these little countries because we're using our traditional knowledge or traditional skills, something that we've been using for the many thousands of years. And then it's today we're using it to replant trees for the future. And then we're making sure that the fossil fuel stay in the in the soil where it is, it is today. It needs to be. What is WAM, and which role does WAM play in RMI's race to climate resilience? I think WAM, or the Canoes of the Marshall Islands, one element module, is one of the best efforts toward this resilience uh, uh, toward climate change. We're using our uh, traditional knowledge to educate our young people. So we bring all these 
kids as with youth to the program, educate them with the skills that we've been practicing for thousands of years. So we're promoting. At the same time, we're giving them another door of opportunity. So from being dropped out of schools or you know hanging out in the street, we bring them and show them and teach them this traditional knowledge that bring self-esteem, cultural pride, and at the same time, it'll open doors of opportunities for the for the future. Uh, so we bring in, you know, we teach them the uh, replantation, we teach them canoe buildings, and by doing this, they also automatically knows language, math, science, and everything that is equivalent to what we have in classroom today. So, not only that, not only for the, the advantage is not only for the kids, but it's also for the uh, educational institutes, for the government, for everybody that is part of it. Because for the educational institute, right now we're working on a um, classroom curriculum that will be included in our national curriculum system that is all from canoe building or uh, traditional canoe knowledge. And with this classroom curriculum, it's, we're including science and math and social studies and health and everything that goes with it. By using our traditional knowledge in the classroom, in using the canoes as the medium, it gives the kids more interest because it's already part of them. So it gives them more interest to study it, to learn it. It's them. And with that format or that platform, It'll help them so they can become a marine biologist, so they can become oceanographer, so they can become anything else that is related to hands and minds working together. And it's all from this people sometimes they say skill of the past, but it's actually the skill of today and the skills of tomorrow. So the canoe program is not only doing what we're doing right now, we're documenting the step-by-step -step construction of all of these things that we're doing, which help countries that do not have these skills, would help other institutes that needs these for their research purposes. Not only that, but because we are um, ocean people, we look at other formats other designs and we design our designs that fits into the, our today's life. We have catamaran that we already built, we have proa that we already built and we design those designs that is really fit into our communities, our way of life today. Not saying that we're going to forget our traditional canoes because that's it is actually part of it. So. That really helped um, the communities and the outliers. And not only that, but they help our government to save money on fuel usage. Our countries use more than 60% of our annual budget for, uh, for our fossil fuel usage. Ever since the inception of the canoe program, uh, the one element module program, we've been uh, gradually, you know, expanding and expanding to the point where we are involved with more than just the martial arts. First of all, uh, the one program is an NGO, non-government organization or non-profit organization. So we automatically are working with many NGOs within the country to share what we have already uh, been accomplished with different NGOs so they can take it from there and uh, evolve it into different things or whatever the focus they have they can use our um, you know the, the knowledge that we have gained to add on to what they have. The local government now they're actually also involved in it by using the skills that we have gained uh, as a matter of fact, you know, right now we have a program with GIZ out of Germany 
And this program is we are, um, as I mentioned earlier, that we are building uh, and designing new crafts that it's, you know, that would fit more or fit in the other islands within modern needs. Right now, people use, uh, are collect, are making copper oil. So what do they need? They need a bigger vessel that be shallower draft so they can come closer to the island and, you know, uh, collect copras and make copras. So we're, we're designing accordingly, you know, uh, fishing. So we have another design with the proa. So where we use the proa vessel for our fishing purposes, for fishing without, you know, any worry about the weather or, you know, uh, ice or things that we need when you need fish to deliver to the center. So these vessels, they're, the design came from the, from the um, canoe design from that, you know, that skill. Anyhow, so with the GIZ program, we're able to cut the, um, the fuel consumption with the government, ship, National Shipping Corporation, the government have National Shipping Corporation, where they go to the out islands, to the atolls, and stop. They have so many stop in the other islands. So that's a lot of cons uh, fuel consumption. But by providing these boats, they're able to collect cobras or cargo that needs to get on the ship and centralize uh, a place to uh, drop off where the ship will come in. So it saves so much fuel. It saves so much fuel that the, uh, in turn, the government will save a lot of money. That means the country will survive longer because less fossil fuel has been used. So our program is not just working with the partner NGOs, but with the local government, with the national government, with the international partners. Now we are one of the groups that give talks around the world on sustainable sea transport because of the traditional innocent through our canoeing culture. We have, currently we have some trainees from the uh, outer islands who are here with us from Kwajalein Atoll, Lai and Lep, and our other, from these atolls, we brought them in so they can stay with us for three months and learn this new technique that will add benefits of our vessel, of our, the, you know, to the outer island setting. So how does WAM's vision for the future look like? Our goal is to make sure that every island within the Marshall Islands have a canoe for every single family to enjoy these traditions that we've survived on for the last couple thousand years. And to share this and any other designs of vessels that we are enjoying today with our friends out there, other countries, so we can utilize our tradition to work with the young people for the good of our future. Keep that 1.5 alive, because without that 1.5, small countries like the Marshall Islands will be underwater. So we need your help. I challenge you, I challenge the big countries to stand with the small countries I challenge the leaders from the big countries to stand with the leaders in the small countries and small people like myself and all these little programs, all the youth today that are struggling to stand with us to fight against climate change. Make sure that we have the, you know, we survive. We have the right to live in this world. Yes, I think there is not much to add on the last sentence. Um, I would, as an engineer, I always look a bit more into the, the technical part. Elson has mentioned a lot of things the program is doing in the Marshall Islands. Um, first of all, the traditional canoe. 
Wana Elon and Majel is, is all about canoes, the traditional canoes. So when, when you look at it, it looks unlike any other craft, any other sailing craft in the world. And when the first uh, Western visitors came to the Marshall Islands in the 16th century, they were astonished by their performance and by their speed because they were far superior to anything that has ever been sailing in Europe at that time. And even for the next few hundred years. So, for example, Elson already mentioned the asymmetric hull shape of these outrigger canoes. It's the same shape that is today um, used for the wings of airplanes. And the entire setup with these little outrigger to one side of the main hull. When you look at the latest racing monohulls that are competing in, in the big sailing races around the world, and uh, actually these sailing boats are the fastest water vessels to circumnavigate the globe. There is no, it's not a motorized vessel, it's a sailing vessel. And these sailing racing boats, multi-million uh, dollars each campaign, they use a quite similar setup. So they have a huge canting keel under the boat that they move to each direction, always to the windward side to counter the force of the sail. And the Marshallese, 2,000 years ago, they came up with the same idea. They have a main hull, and then they have a small uh, balancer, a counterbalance. So that's, it's basically the same design. Another thing is the um, outrigger complex. So the connection between the small hull and the big hull, it's uh, a built-in shock absorber. So both hulls and the waves, they can move independently of each other and reducing the stress on the entire construction. And uh, that's something Western engineers recently came up with for, for multi-hulls. Marshall Lee's doing that since 2000 years. Um, last but not least, the sail looks pretty simple. It's just a triangle. But when you look at modern combat aircrafts, or the Space Shuttle or the Concorde, you will see the same uh, shape for the wings. It's also a triangle. And uh, Western scientists are just about to understand how it really works. So that's uh, kind of fascinating um, that these canoes were developed on, on tiny little islands in the Pacific Ocean thousands of years ago. And as you've already seen, these islands, whenever you want to do something, you need a canoe. And because of that, the canoe is very important part of, of everything that is related to culture and uh, to community efforts to, to the people. They say it's the heart and the soul of the Marshallese people. As has already pointed out, it's also important for the um, for the ecosystem on land, because for the traditional canoes, they need a lot of lumber. But that's something we're going to uh, look into later. People often ask me when I, when I talk about my work, why do they need a foreign engineer when they are able to build such marvelous sailing vessels? What are you doing there? Why, why do they need you? And to be honest, it's... Uh, question it's not so difficult uh, not so so uh, simple to answer um, there's a couple of, of uh, more factors so first of all these entire canoeing culture was in a decline throughout the 20th century so we've earlier we've seen the picture the black and white picture of the huge uh, voyaging canoe it was made around 1880 but let's say around 1950, the last voyaging canoe was were rotting away. And since then, no offshore voyages has been made. So this decline is also um, related to the importance of the outrigger canoe for the culture because, and for the way of living. Because 
at that time, at the 1950s, after World War II, the Western way of living, the American way of life, came more prominent, especially for the young people. And a symbol for the old way, the Outrigger canoe um, was not very attractive. And people were just not interested in it. Fuel was cheap. It was more convenient to use a um, motorized boat. So why learning all the skills? Why having, having all the inconvenience of sailing and dealing with wind? And um, why do that why, when you can just take a outrigger canoe? So, So oh, sorry about that. Um, so, many eventually many island communities entirely lost uh, lost their canoes, and um, there, there are some atolls that haven't had seen a canoe for for 30 years. And I would I would estimate that the majority of the Marshallese people, especially the young, the young ones, have never been sailing on one. So today. Canoes are very much needed because fuel is expensive. It's about eight to ten uh, U.S. dollars per gallon on the outer islands, and when you compare that to an average income of one or two U.S. dollars per day, you're going to need quite a while to save enough uh, money to pay your ride for fishing or your trip to the neighbor island. So these canoes today are, are very much needed also for fishing because. The, island, the islands are just not very good for farming. You can, you, can, you can plant something there, but the main food source has always been the ocean. And to access this natural resource, you, uh, you, yeah, you need a canoe or a boat. And without a canoe, you would have to pay for the fuel. Without the money for the fuel, you end up without any fish. So many island communities rely on uh, imported food. So every once in a while, usually like two or three times a year, the Marshall Island Shipping Corporation comes with a freighter and brings supplies of rice and canned food. So they are totally dependent on, on, on the imported goods. A second reason um, for yeah, for the problems the canoeing culture is facing, is uh, the lack of lumber, because the traditional canoes they were dugout canoes. They were made from huge logs of breadfruit trees, and um, as Elson already mentioned in the interview, these trees used to be planted on purpose for canoe building. Because when you, when you build a canoe, you want a tree that is long and straight. You don't want it to, to reach out very far. So what you do, you plant them right next to each other and uh, make them long and tall. These, um, these habits, these constant circle of replantation that stopped throughout the 20th century because uh, there was no interest in canoes anymore. So why putting some effort in planting more trees? Second reason is breadfruit trees, as the name already suggests, they make breadfruit, and that's a very available food source. So the remaining trees, um, they're usually not cut down. They, they only sick and old trees that don't give fruit anymore are used for, yeah, for lumber. So there is a real shortage on, on trees. And now there's a third thing coming up, it's climate change and sea level rise. Like usually these breadfruit trees, they go, grow inside of the island where they are protected from salt spray in the air and where they have direct access to the freshwater lands 
of these these tiny islets. But with uh, more storms and more splash on the outside of the island, there's more salty air, and at the same time, the rising sea level is uh, is putting up building up pressure on the freshwater lands. So breadfruit trees are already today, they don't grow that well anymore. And that will, will only be worse in the future. So it is very difficult, if not impossible, to keep these thousands of years old knowledge about building the canoes alive by only relying on, on breadfruit lumber. So, to preserve that for future generations and at the same time solving the problems w with uh, sea transport and fishing and emissions in the Marshall Islands today, we basically need to come up with a plan to make these canoes from other materials. One of these materials already used in the Marshall Islands and widely available is plywood. So it's imported plywood and that's going to be combined with local lumber. So other kinds of lumber or smaller parts. But when you, when you look at a huge, huge log, that's a huge piece of wood that's already three-dimensional. So what you do is you carve it and it's like sculpturing. You, the shape is already in there, you just have to find it. But that's a whole different approach with plywood. Plywood is two-dimensional, it's just a sheet. So how do you going to turn that into a hull? That doesn't work with the traditional, uh, with the traditional skills and with the traditional uh, way of manufacturing these canoes. So we um, developed a technique based on the stitch and glue Stitch and glue is a well-known uh, technique for building boats from plywood. has been out there since the 60s, I think, 1960s, since plywood came up. And um, we further developed that and combined this technique to, um, to adapt the traditional ways of how these canoes were made and measured so that eventually the process stays the same like it was for thousands of years, but the material has changed. So how, how are we going to do that? How are these canoes built today? First of all, it starts with measuring. When you want to build something, you need to, you need to make sure how big, how long, uh, which dimension you, uh, you're going to need. So, traditionally the Marshallese canoes were measured in a very sophisticated um, pattern of relations for each part, for each uh, line, for each, uh, for each design feature of these canoes. So, every, everything of these canoes is in relation to each other. There is no system of units or something like meters or feet. It's, everything is in relation. It's, basically, it's uh, by the way, the same technique that was used in, uh, in Europe before steel boats emerged. There was also a boat builder who knew the right relation for a boat, the right shape from his father and were just building it that way. So we incorporated that technique you can see it here on the pictures with a string. We incorporated that to the plywood stitch and glue technique. So what you do first, you, um, you're going to get two sheets of plywood and you're going to put the outline on it. So that's what you're going to see here. So each, this sheet that's lying flat on the ground, that will later be one side of the canoe hull. Each canoe hull consists of two sides, right and left, or windward and leeward, and the cross-section has a V-shape, or a triangle shape. So, these sides are measured in the same way as a lock would have been measured, 
only difference is it's now laying flat on the ground and a log, uh, a breadfruit log would be three-dimensional. But everything else remains the same. So the master canoe builders can still decide which type of design they want to like. They can still build the traditional design according uh, to what they have ever done on the islands and what works best for the atoll. Next step is, and that's where stitching comes into the game, because that's why it's called stitch and glue. These two sheets for, for each side of the canoe is placed flat on the ground and around the bottom, the keel, and the bow and the stern, or other way around. Um, these two sheets are joined with copper wire. Could also use uh, coconut rope or plastic rope or whatever. Um, works best with copper wire and um, they are tightly stitched together with this wire and the interesting thing is here I'm back to the old picture when you look at that one there is a person in a white dress sitting in front of the canoe and below that on the side of the hull you see a black line with little black dots and this is the joint where the upper part of the hull and the middle part of the hull were stitched together with coconut rope. So stitching the hull was already kind of uh, part of the culture, but now in a whole different context with the plywood. So what happens next? Because now we still have only two flat sheets of plywood. We are still two-dimensional. Um, Next step is to place it within already prepared cradles. And what you see in the front is this little frame. That's the main bulkhead. That what makes the canoe uh, three-dimensional. It has a cross-section of uh, the later hull. So in the next step, these two sheets are just pulled apart. It's like making a paper boat. So you open it up and then you immediately have a three-dimensional canoe hull. If you would release it, it would just pop together and you're back two-dimensional. But especially on the right, you see where they put in the main bulkhead and that fix it, fixes everything in place. So within a couple of seconds, you have a boat hull. Obviously, that is, uh, it's not very strong. It's just parts loosely joined together. So to add some strength, um, epoxy glue is used and is applied as fillets. And these fillets are basically made from resin. And for the Marshall Islands, we adopted the recipe. We're using actually baking flour for it because the usually glue powder is not available. But baking flour is, we did some, some uh, tests on the strength and the durability. It's uh, as good as the glue powder, as it turned out. So these fillets, it's basically little bats of, of epoxy. It's like, uh, like, like a welding, yeah, it's like, like welding two uh, plates of metal together, but from, from wood and joined with glue. These little uh, fillets are applied everywhere where bulkheads meet, where the uh, side sheets meet at the keel, um, everywhere where you need strength. And basically that's it, how, how a hull is made. And since we introduced that, it's uh, a matter of weeks to finish a canoe, not of months. So it's way si actually way simpler and far less work than it was uh, with the dugout canoes. And the result is way lighter, can carry more goods, and it's lasting much longer because the traditional canoes, they were, they were not really well preserved. And in the humid climate of the Marshall Islands, they were, um, yeah, they were just rotting away within 10 years. And a canoe built to this, uh, to this standard 
if you if you maintain it well, it can last for 40 years. And uh, yeah, it's 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 just uh, it will be there for a way longer time. So that was about the main hull. The tiny little outrigger hull could be made the same, is sometimes already made the same way, also stitch and glue from plywood. But because this part is way smaller, most of the time still a lock is used, a smaller branch of a tree. So the smaller parts are still available, so it's just uh, more efficient to use uh, solid lumber there. Um, same for the beams. Sail and spars. Spars are made from uh, either from local lumber or from imported lumber. Depends on the availability. The sail is made from modern sailcloth because it just lasts way longer. Traditionally, for the sail, um, woven pandanus leaves were used, but it's a lot of work to harvest and process and to weave these sails. It's way more work than actually making the canoe, and they don't last very long. So what islanders usually do, they use polytarp sheets. But these polytarp sheets, they also don't last very long, maybe one year or two years, and then they start to deteriorate and to release lots of little plastic parts in the wind and in the ocean. So by using uh, Dacron sailcloth, uh, we're trying to avoid that. This Dacron cloth is either recycled from old yacht sails or brand new material. Um, if it's protected from UV light when not in use, it can easily last for 20, 30 years if well maintained. Um, yeah, and then only two more tasks left. It's giving a proper paint job to protect it from, from sunlight, to protect it from water, to uh, yeah, it's basically all about keeping water away from the wood so the boat will last as long as possible. And um, lashing is a very interesting and important point because there is not a single piece of metal on these entire canoes. It's only wood and rope. Every part is lashed to each, uh, to each other by, uh, by a rope lashing. And if you think about that, it makes totally sense because on a coral atoll, there is no metal. You can't get any metal there. There is only coral. So metal was just unknown in the, um, in the ancient times. So the people used rope. And actually, the rope makes the entire structure flexible. And this flexibility is what allows the canoe to have a smooth ride on the waves and at the same time to reduce the stress and the, um, the high loads on, on every part to make it last longer and, well, maybe to make it last at all in the waves. So with this new way of making outrigger canoes and this new way of um, using the material, the idea came up, um, why not adapting the traditional design to the modern needs? Because when you start from a lock, the outrigger canoe is maybe the best, is, is maybe the best uh, solution. It's, it's the best approach. But with the modern materials, you have a whole, uh, a whole lot of other options too. So we really went into the different atolls and were in close communication with the island communities what kinds of boats, of canoes, of transport means they really need. For example, uh, if there is a very shallow lagoon, they need a boat with a shallow draft. If they are going to make a lot of copra, which is dried coconut meat, um, they need a boat that can carry lots of these copra. So eventually, we have built two new prototype vessels which are now extensively tested in the Marshallese waters. Um, one of them is a proa design, which is very similar to the Marshallese outrigger canoe. And 
The other one here on the right is a catamaran design, which is uh, a step away of the outrigger design because it is a tacking vessel. It's not a shunting vessel. All these traditional canoes we have been talking about so far are shunting. Shunting means they don't come about when they want to turn around. They always keep one side to the wind and the other, other side to leeward. So it's a whole other approach of sailing compared to what we do here in, in the Western world. All our vessels, they turn around like a car. And the Marshallese approach is more like, uh, like, a, uh, like a train. It goes back and forth and always keeps one side to the wind. So this catamaran on the right, this is a tacking canoe, so it comes about, it turns around in the Western style, which was a very new thing for the Marshallese people, for the canoe sailors. We've called it, because it was made in close collaboration with WAM, we've called it the WAM catamaran. And it's a very simple construction because both of these hulls are like the same. It's a very simple shape. It's uh, very quickly to build. It's, um, has, it uses the same sail as traditional canoes. Actually, the sail you see here is a, is a gray sail. Um, we took it straight from a canoe without any modifications. So it's also an advantage. You only need one sail. You can use it on either a traditional canoe or the catamaran. Um, another important thing, this boat offers dry cargo compartments. So you see these little uh, cabins on each side, these little bulbs. Inside there is enough space even for me to take a nap and enough space to get six bags of dried coconut meat in each, uh, each of these hulls. It's a weight of about 800 kilos. And uh, this is quite important because copra is, needs to be dry to last. If it's wet, it's it going to rot. And on the second hand, it is always uh, it is measured and uh, the value is, is uh, measured by the weight and by the moisture content. So in order to sell high quality uh, copra and to get a, get a good price for it, of course the, the islander want to, wants to keep it dry. On a traditional canoe, on a smaller one, that's impossible because the canoe hull is so slim and so, uh, so narrow. So they have to transport it on top and rather than plastic sheets. It's still going to be a little bit wet when it arrives. So this warm catamaran can transport lots of copra. They call it the pickup truck of the lagoon and uh, keep it dry. At the same time, it's because it's taking, it's also a very, uh, it's very easy to sail. It's very, very simple to operate, very safe to operate. Because the traditional canoe, they take they require a lot of strength of the sailor and they require skills in, in how to use it. It takes a lot of practice to, to safely operate it in all conditions. And with the warm catamaran, that's a whole different story because everything, everything is easy to move. You don't need the physical strength. And uh, according to many communities, that's a game changer for gender equality because now everyone can, uh, can get access to, to transportation, to carbon-free, emission-free transportation. Second prototype we've designed is the Harry Prower. The Harry Prower is a design brand, or it's a, it's a boat designer from Australia, it's Rob Denny. And uh, he's known for very, uh, very advanced um, design ideas and really for thinking out of the box and what we've done here is basically adapting the traditional concept but combining it with a very shallow draft with uh, easier even easier to make box section how 
so it's super super simple to build and it's it's a very fast design and the most important thing is it has a fish hold because it's specially designed for fishing so as I already said fishing is very important for food security especially under the threat of climate change when when the uh, land is, is, is getting flooded frequent, more frequently in the future. So you really need to, uh, you really need a boat, a, a fishing vessel to, you can rely on to, to get seafood for your family. And this boat on the large hull, here on the, on the bottom picture on the left, it has a compartment that is constantly flooded with seawater. So when you catch fish, you can put the fish in there and it stays fresh for uh, for a long for a while, not forever, but for for a while, and you don't need any ice for it. It's not as good as ice for keeping it fresh, but it's uh, way cheaper than than getting ice. So in this little cabin in this in this uh, on the windward hull, the smaller hull, um, we've put in a, ki a small kitchen, so fish can be prepared right on the water, or even on the way home. So, this canoe is basically a sustainable uh, fish factory for, uh, for, hook, for uh, trawling, line and hook fishing inside the lagoon and even a little bit outside in the waters, if conditions allow. It's a potential game changer for food security of some communities. Building up on all that, WAM is now organizing and hosting training workshops. So, for each workshop of three months, WAM takes in participants from outer island communities that sometimes they are canoe builders or very experienced sailors, sometimes they're just normal people and they stay at WAM for a while. They build one of these two prototypes within their training and eventually they build their own sailing canoe and, and their own traditional canoe. And after this training they take it home to their island and are able to host their own workshop there and to spread the knowledge, to spread the skills. And by this approach this year, we have, uh, or WAM was able to introduce or to reintroduce a canoe to an island that has lost canoes 30 years ago. And WAM did a really good job in reconstructing the traditional design of that atoll. And now they have, they have their canoe back. They, they can build up on that. It was the first time the kids there have seen their canoe, their own, their own vessel, their own yeah, they're one of the most important things of their culture. So the curriculum of these training workshops, it's uh, obviously the canoe design. It's, um, it's a little bit about the background as well. Why does the canoe look the way it does look? And also thinking that step further, how do I adapt the design to the needs I see at my home place? So if people come, they, they come with their home in mind. So they come with their, with their island in mind. They know what they need, but they might not be able to, um, to, to have a design in mind or to transfer it to, to a canoe. That's... Uh, what we're trying to, to teach and what we're trying to uh, incorporate in that program to um, start to kick off this um, process of, of designing and testing and designing and testing again. So this circle of constant improvement. Um, second thing, very basic, are tools. Like the traditional canoes there were, there were lots of traditional tools as well, like chisels and hammers and um, axles and all those things. 
today for the plywood boats, for the plywood canoes, we need uh, a different set of tools sometimes. So that's something we introduce. Um, at the same time, power tools. If you're from an island with insufficient power supply, you won't, go on, you won't use power tools there. So that's sometimes a new thing. Um, then we have, of course, the new building techniques that I already said, the stitch and glue technology, the measuring of the canoe, um, the combination of indigenous knowledge and, uh, and yeah, modern engineering um, that we uh, include in the training. And last but not least, of course, sailing and safety. I combine that because sailing, obviously, you need to know what you're doing. As I already said, the catamaran, for example, um, as a tacking vessel, is, is a very strange craft for most of the canoe sailors. So it, it takes some time to get used to it. And WAM is really doing uh, sea trials. They go 20, 30, 40 miles over the lagoon. They try it in heavy weather. They introduce the trainees to all different kinds of conditions. So they really know what they're doing. So they really get a training to be, to be seamen, to be, to be canoe sailors. And uh, yeah, that's safety, of course. You need, you need to be sure what you're doing. Safety at the same time with the materials, because plywood is, well, it's basically wood, but epoxy, you need to be, the epoxy glue we need to, we use to uh, glue everything with, you need to be careful with because it's, uh, it's, if it's uncured, it's potentially toxic. So um, you need to be aware of that, of course. Um, yeah, safety as well for using the tools for um, dealing with environment, for dealing with the ocean. That's uh, also very important. So how does it look like in, in, in a workshop? So what you see here is kind of mass production of canoes. It's uh, four canoes at a time, one for each trainee. So we're going from a sheet of plywood on the ground to the cut it out line, the stitched and already glued hull shape, um, paint job almost done in the bottom right, and uh, I think it's a long time ago that so many canoes has been built at a time on the Marshall Islands. So, benefits for the local communities. What, why should local communities uh, be part of that project? It's, um, first of all, the availability of uh, transportation that these canoes as the canoes as well as the uh, prototype designs offer for, for everyone. Um, second, it's especially in the scope of uh, climate change and um, the NDCs, it's a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So you want to be fossil fuel free as fast as possible um, to keep to, yeah, to keep the island alive, to keep the island above, above the sea level. And at the same time, fossil fuel is very expensive. So the sooner the better um, that we get away of fossil fuel use. Um, another thing very important is food security. Already mentioned that the islands um, without uh, canoes, without sailing boats, they are they really depend on imported food. If the ships with the canned food and rice supply are late, people sometimes starve because they can't go fishing. And the ocean around the islands is full of fish, but you need a boat to access these resources. If you don't have that, you, you basically sit on your island surrounded by food, but you can't get to it. And you have to wait for the... Um, for the freighter to bring you rice and uh, sometimes even tin can tuna 
that was caught in the Marshallese uh, waters by Chinese trawlers. So, um, last but not least, all these these three uh, bullets above, they contribute to um, to pride and self-esteem for the islanders. They uh, help to offer um, a reason for young people to stay there, to make a living there. If you if you totally depend on on someone else, you will you will never have. Uh, pride and self-esteem in, in your way of living. But by, by reviving these canoes, the people can take their life in their own hands, make their own decisions and be self-reliable and independent on these islands. So to give you a, a shorter outlook on um, what we plan to do in the future is the second phase of these workshops. So, right now we have developed the stitch and glue technique for canoes up to 30 feet. It's about 10 meter in length. But when you reach that size, you can't, with, with the technique we use right now, you can't really make them any larger. So, we have to come up with a plan, and we are already working on that, to do basically the same thing we have done for the small canoes, but for the big ones. And these big canoes are potentially those ones that are capable to cross over the open ocean between the atolls. So what we're trying to do with that is to regain the former capabilities the Marshallese people have had. Because when you remember where that place is, they somehow discovered these islands before anybody else found them. So they had these capabilities to go there and they used to trade. We have actually photographs, we have seen them. These boats really existed. So that is kind of the scope for the second phase of, of the training workshops, to slowly get step by step towards that goal. Um, Another objective is uh, a larger sailing cargo freighter because we are not going to meet all the transportation needs between the atolls with uh, large trading canoes. We also need conventional freighters but sail powered. And the project right now is working on an additional vessel, a wind powered vessel, a more modern one based on the design of the SV Quai to um, offer service for the Marshall Islands Shipping Corporation. And at the same time, it is supposed to be a training vessel where young Marshallese seamen get uh, yeah, proper training in, in uh, seamanship and especially in cargo sailing. And uh, the last and maybe the most important thing is the upscaling on uh, other regions on other countries because around the world most of the populations living close to the ocean so they all the ocean is not only rising in the Marshall Islands it's rising everywhere because the sea level like the name implies is more or less leveled so everyone who is living next to the ocean is facing the same problems so the goal of this entire project is to develop techniques and schemes and plans, make uh, experiences and gain skills and knowledge to share with uh, other places around the world. So I would like to finish this with uh, some Marshallese words I've learned at WAM. Marshallese delegation, please uh, excuse my pronunciation. So they say wakuk wajimoa. That means canoes bring people together. And when you really think about it, that's true in every possible sense. So when you make a canoe, it's a huge effort. You're not going to do that alone. And when you operate the canoe, it's also always a community effort. The community is profiting altogether from the canoe. So when they 
when they transport some stuff, when they get fish, it's all shared. When you're out on the ocean, you really have to rely on your crew when you sail in these canoes. Or basically, when you sail on any boat. When you fall off the canoe, you're lost. When you don't trust your, your crewmates and you're not working properly together, you will never get where you want to go. And if you're not working together to maintain your canoe, you, the canoe might break apart and you will never get where you want. And after all, when you look at uh, our planet Earth, it's only a very small, when you look from far away, it's only a very small little space canoe sailing through a huge empty ocean. And we have to come all together to maintain this canoe, to look after it and to make sure it's in a good shape. So we're getting eventually there where we want to go and we're not getting lost. Oh, thank you very much. So, we are here now for uh, question and answer, for discussion, for anything you'd like to know. Um, please just ask. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much.